studied um, national myself and an alumna of both institutions, i.e. as we were exposed to other European nations and to the US due to Lebanon's historic time, but once you visit this country, you dramatically are. Madrid is just like Beirut, dynamic, welcoming, family-oriented city, while probably the only difference is the sacred siesta time. And both, yeah, just a few weeks ago, which to be honest had me worried because of the lack of Lebanon and Spain, here we are. So I would like to congratulate the entire team behind it and the smallest details above all the parties made this event happen. This is the entrepreneurial spirit IE thrives for the world through its strong focus on entrepreneurship, innovation and diversity. Its innovative teaching techniques may launch several degrees in the field of communication, law, international relations and architect programs. It is consistently described as the most international educational institution in the, in the world and the alumni to be dynamic, proactive, entrepreneurial, and committed. And now I will give the world to our officially president of the Association in Lebanon. I would like to welcome you to our economic panel, Lebanon and Spain, two countries, one vision out of the economic crisis. Let me extend a special welcome to Dr. Gonzalo Garland, who came from Madrid specially to participate in this panel, whose interests and expertise will, enrich, will be enriching our discussions. Our thanks go to Ms. Laila Kirkmaz, Mr. Mazen Firsti, Mr. Johnny El Haj, uh, Mr. Manuel Duran, uh, Premier Counselor at the Spanish Embassy, and Ms. Sabine Esbik from IE, who helped a lot in the preparation for this event. Also, a big thank you goes to IE team, Yorgo Bijani, Marie Jo Jamus, Hussein Aitani, Nadim Abdelama, Nahla Sibawi, and Camille Atier. Thanks to the Economic Department at AUD and the Spanish Embassy, who are our partners in organizing this event. Ladies and gentlemen, two years ago, the IE Alumni Association in Beirut held the economic panel under the name uh, Economic Climate Change Following the Arab Spring Revolution. At that time, we spoke about our shared hope for change. Since then, the Middle East has undergone change like no other part of the world. That happened in a speed and a direction that many experts would not have thought as possible. Many see these changes will brighten the future of the region. The Arab Spring has opened doors to new opportunities, but in many countries, the direction is still not clear. It wasn't just a matter of freedom, especially for young people who want to be part of a society and participate in the economy's success. Like what happened in 1990, after the fall of the Wall of Berlin, Europeans experienced an economic boom in investment. Dreams and vision for the Middle East countries also include that kind of boom. Visions are important to produce positive change, but they need to be concrete and feasible. We have many visions here in Lebanon, and we're just working hard to make them become real. On the other hand, two years ago, Spain was getting out of the world economic crisis. I remember back then, Dr. Garland, in our uh, economic panel, he said that the global economy is gonna crash back into a double dip, and he was right. And luckily, now Spain is showing good signs out of the crisis. At this economic panel, we want to discuss these issues and how, in all nowadays difficulties, we can build bridge, bridges, a new cultures and economic bridges between Lebanon and Spain. And who is better than Ms. Yumna Naukal, moderate this panel? We are looking forward to what promises to be a highly interesting and fruitful discussion. Her Excellency Milagros Hernando, your presence underscores the importance of this event. Your continuous support for us and all Lebanon, Lebanese who adore Spain, the country, the culture, the language, the food, and the Real Madrid, and the little bit Barcelona. It's just remarkable. Please allow me to welcome you on stage. Thank you. I would like to start this uh, little words by thanking, thanking all of us, uh, all of you, for uh, being able to be uh, this afternoon uh, together. And to thank the American University for facilitating us uh, this auditorium. Before this uh, round table, I would like to share with you uh, two comments. 
The first one will be for the Instituto de Empresa, for the IE. Why? Because for us, for uh, the Spanish Embassy, of course, but for the Spanish society, it's a very good piece of news when we know that so many Lebanese towns have decided, decide every year, to choose this Spanish institution to continue their studies. And of course, for all of us, we are very happy when uh, we listened that your time in Madrid, as before was said, uh, is good, that you think the institution has a good level uh, in uh, the formation, in the academic uh, background, but that you are happy in Madrid uh, during your stay. And my second comment uh, will be precisely for the subject of this round table. Spanish economy, Lebanese economy, international economy, European, regional economy. All of us, we are in the middle of our own uh, context. About the Lebanese economy, I'm sure that uh, I will learn a lot this, uh, this afternoon. Thanks to all the participants for being with us today. And about the first, about the Spanish economy, of course, just five seconds to underline that is true. In the last four years, for all of us, we are very difficult times. The consequences of the American financial crisis that began in 2008 uh, had terrible effects on, our, um, on the Spanish economy, on our life uh, for every day. But uh, we think that the reforms uh, put into force were important enough as uh, to be able to think that uh, by the end of this year, by the beginning of the next one, we are going to have different times. We are going to begin to see um, new uh, figures and new life in our country. Yesterday I was talking to some uh, friends, perhaps it was Dr. Gonzalo Garland, I don't know, and we were saying that perhaps the most important thing is recover the optimism. Anyway, I have to say that from my time here, and I am here like one year and a half, any time that you ask you, Lebanese, you ask us, you ask me, about the, economy, uh, the, about the economy, about the situation in Spain, you do with a wonderful affect, with a wonderful worry about us. And I appreciate this very much because I see there that you, well, you love our countries and you are happy when for us is good. Well, uh, allow me just to finish these words that are in a little, <laughs> uh, not with a lot of light. Um, allow me to finish these words saying thank you very much for the association. Thank you very much for this young group of uh, students from the IE that are working in here with a lot of optimism, playing uh, with a lot of energy and of course we are going to support you and to, and we are going to support your initiatives of course every time you propose something or we will propose you uh, something. Thank you very much for all the participants for being with us today and we hope we are going to learn a lot uh, this afternoon with all your uh, comments, reflections, uh, thoughts about uh, both economies and about both economic contexts. Thank you. Thank you very much. One vision out of the economic crisis. My name is Yumna Nelfad and I am the editor and anchor of the Daily English Newscast on Future Television. I'll be moderating the 45-minute discussion, after which there will be a 10 to 15-minute Q&A. Please ensure your phones are silenced, though we would enjoy your ringtones, but please. Um, Lebanon and Spain are Mediterranean nations revered for their distinct beauty and unique cultures, and both are in the midst of economic difficulties. Like Her Excellency Mrs. Ambassador said, Spain is suffering as a result of the European crisis and the global economic downturn, 
and Lebanon is entering its 10th month without a government in place and is being negatively impacted by the spillover of the Syrian civil war. So how can we define the economic relationship between Lebanon and Spain? Where do the challenges lie in bilateral trade and relations? And most importantly, how can we boost investment opportunities between these two nations? With us today to provide some perspective are four experts in their respective fields. Flying in from Spain, especially for our discussion, is Professor Gonzalo Garland, the Vice President for Development at IE Business School in Madrid. Professor Garland is currently a professor in the fields of economics in environment and business in emerging markets. And his areas of expertise includes the study of economies of developing countries such as China, India, Brazil, and Mexico, to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Garland. Mrs. Reya Hafer Hassan is the former Lebanese Minister of Finance from 2009 until 2011. She was also a member of the offices of then Prime Minister Saad Hariri and Fuad Senyura, where she led a number of projects, notably the elaboration of the government's economic and social reform agenda under the Paris International Donor Conferences. Welcome, Mrs. Al Hassan. <laughs> Dr. Nabil Fahed is the Vice Chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, Industry, and Agriculture of Beirut and Mount Lebanon. He's also the Chairman and CEO of Fahad Holding, a group of retail and distribution companies in Lebanon. He has previously held the positions of Investment Officer in Oil and Gas at the International Finance Corporation World Bank in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Mr. Fahad. And last but not least, Mrs. Leila Sawai al Khoudi, who is currently a UN Project Manager at the Investment Development Authority of Lebanon, also known as IDAL, where she is supporting the institution in developing and implementing its investment promotion strategy. She also worked at the Prime Minister's office where she was responsible for monitoring the implementation of the country's socio-economic reform program and drafting a regional socio-economic development strategy. Welcome, Mrs. Khoudi. <laughs> Professor Garland, I'm going to start with you. According to the International Monetary Fund, Spain had a negative GDP growth of minus 1.6% in 2012, and it went down to 1.3, minus 1.3 in 2013, a level that is much lower than the world GDP growth currently estimated at 2.9 for 2013. Unemployment also reached a record high of 26.8% in 2012, and remains high this year at 26%. However, ratings agency Moody's about four days ago raised its outlook for Spain's economy from negative to stable saying there has been a real improvement in the economy and government finances. Is this a sign of recovery? Well, uh, let me start by saying just very briefly that I'm very happy to be back in Beirut as well. I will say it's my second time here, so it's great to be here, and thank you very much for all of you at the embassy, at uh, the university, and all the panelists that are here in the library. Let me say it in a way in response to the question about Spain. Uh, clearly, Spain went, we all know, through a very important crisis in recent years as the most important crisis in the world, first of all. So we have to keep into account that it's not just in Spain, it was a world crisis, the most profound cri crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, and, uh, and there were actually very hard years. However, if you look at the IMF, for example, in its recent forecast, as you mentioned, the IMF, if you look at the map of the growth in this year for 2013, it's interesting because uh, they paint in different colors the, the rates of growth. And you will see that clearly Europe is the area of the world where the slowest growth is happening. However, the IMF just recently changed its discourse. It was talking about a three-speed recovery, two-speed recovery in the world, where you have the um, emerging countries growing much faster, and at the same time, the high-income countries growing much slower. The IMF started talking about, uh, maybe in the second report of this, of this year, started talking about a three-speed recovery, where the U.S. started recovering faster, and, and, and Europe stayed, particularly the Eurozone, stays somewhat slower. However, as it was mentioned before, clearly we are seeing significant uh, signs of a recovery in Spain. The prime, uh, I mean, the risk premium that uh, the debt of Spain was paying a year ago only is significantly, I mean, 
significantly lower now. Uh, unemployment is true, still is high, but at the same time, we have the, the first growth in the third quarter of this year. And at the same time, for the, the last month of November, for the first unemployment data, actually, uh, unemployment goes down. So, so we start to see uh, good signs. As the ambassador was saying before, the general perception is that Spain is getting out of the worst situation right now. So there are signs for optimism. What is Spain doing to get out of the economic crisis? Well, I think it's very important to, to probably realize that when you have a crisis, you can have different options. But one of the, of the options is really to realize that it's the time to do reforms that will help you in the future. And I think that's what Spain has been doing over, over recent years. The, the, cha the challenge itself, the crisis puts Spain into a situation where it has to question almost everything. And therefore, there's a lot of reforms that have been occurring that are very helpful, and I can talk, uh, we can talk about them, but you have seen clearly fiscal measures in order to reduce the fiscal deficit, which of course, we can talk about the past exercises on fiscal policies, but at the same time, there were also cyclical effects of, 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 on, on fiscal policies, and there are a lot of structural reforms, pension reform, which is something that's needed in Spain and many other countries in Europe. There's also uh, labor reform, there's also reform of the administrations, and, and some, many analysts, and I'm not talking inside Spain, but outside of Spain, are saying that many, maybe other countries in Europe are not going through these process of structural reforms in Spain to go. So hopefully, of course, there are a lot of challenges ahead, but hopefully uh, when the situation goes back into a recovery, which is still in an early process, this is not to say that right now there are no problems in Spain, too, there's still the challenges. Are you expecting to see a lot of recovery in 2014? We're, not a lot, but uh, we're, we, we think that uh, overall there's this general perception the worst is over. We're starting to see growth, slow growth, and, and, and that's going to take some time to really reduce unemployment levels to the levels that were before. But the fiscal uh, deficit is, is going down too, and therefore there are a lot of signs that indicate that in the future things. Plus, another thing that I might mention is the external sector, and that's also very important. Spain has achieved a, a, a surplus on the current account, which was clearly a very deficit-oriented country before. And some people say, how can you attain that with not with, without a devaluation of your currency, which is clearly what you cannot do now with the euro. And that's pretty remarkable. I mean, there's questions about that. I'm happy to develop that further. But that has been a great achievement in Spain on the crisis. So overall, I would say there are still a lot of challenges. But uh, there's a general perception that Spain has confronted the, uh, the problems and has implemented a lot of measures that will probably be helpful, not only in the short term, but mostly, more importantly, in the medium and long term. That's probably what we are now. Well, thank you for that. I want to get to Lebanon, where I'm going to address my question to you, Mrs. Al Hassan. If the IMF's forecast of another year of 1.5% growth materializes next year, it would mark the first time in at least three decades that Lebanon's economy witnesses a slow growth for four years in a row. Now, the country appears to be headed towards another challenging year, given the stalled government formation process and weakening domestic demand. Also, given the turmoil in Syria, the political and security instability in, in the country, what can we expect for the economy next year? Um, I think for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel discussion. Unfortunately, in answer to your question, I don't have, uh, at least in my opinion, I don't have very positive news to relay. Uh, the prospects for uh, a reversal in the uh, economic dynamics for Lebanon are very bleak, at least for 2014. And this is even uh, at the admission of the Minister of Finance himself, who I estimated the growth rates to be close to 0%, and which is a worse uh, uh, expectation than that of the IMF and the World Bank. So the prospects are, are looking very bleak. And uh, the reason for that being is that the, you know, the, the political context uh, is still uh, very complicated. Uh, the uh, society is more polar polarized than ever. Uh, I see the fact that you know the, there's not going to be any uh, resolving of the Syrian situation anytime soon. It's going to be impacting negatively the uh, Lebanese economy uh, as a result of the influx of the Syrian refugees on uh, on the on the social uh, context of Lebanon and on the economic uh, uh, context. 
Uh, I see the physical discipline is not being honored at all. I see a lot of uh, spending, uh, irresponsible spending, frankly, on the part of this uh, current government, which is uh, exacerbating the de deficit situation and that is putting additional pressure on the debt dynamics in the country. Uh, uh, so uh, the prospects of any uh, positive news coming out of Lebanon, at least in the near future, uh, are not uh, looking bright at all. What are the common challenges and difficulties that both Spain and Lebanon are experiencing? Well, if you look at the surface of it, obviously uh, we are both suffering uh, from uh, large debt ratios. Uh, we, are ha we have large deficit to GDP, even though that of Spain probably is improving much faster than we are. Uh, we suffer from high unemployment rates. Uh, the prospects, uh, at least in the short term, for growth are uh, not very bright. Brighter for Spain, but not very bright for, uh, for Lebanon. Uh, we are both working at trying to enhance our, our competitiveness and trying to enhance the efficiency of our labor markets and to attract FDI. Now this is on the surface. Uh, if you look more closely, uh, we are both uh, uh, suffering from high unemployment rate and this reflects uh, structural rigidities in the labor uh, market. Uh, Spain is attempting to solve some of these problems, I, at least by undertaking some, some labor reforms. Uh, while uh, Lebanon's uh, problem is more structural in nature, I think uh, this is not a cyclical unemployment, this is a structural unemployment and we have always uh, suffered uh, from this uh, phenomenon, and um, even though this has this has been a double-edged sword, if you want, uh, we've suffered from the brain drain, and this has impacted or undermined the productivity of our economy. But at the same time, this has allowed the repatriation of or remittances coming to Lebanon, which has been a life-saving platform for for the Lebanese economy. Uh, as I said. Ministry. Well, the key question is to have the government. I mean, that's a prerequisite, obviously. Uh, okay. Well, that's not an easy question, uh, at least in the current context, to answer. But assuming there is a government, and a government that ensures some sort of consensus building, and assuming that this government comes in and puts a, a, you know, a tangible or a clear economic vision that is translated into a tangible and measurable economic agenda. Well, this, these are assumptions, huh? And assuming that confidence is restored, and assuming that assuming uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, economic and political relations with the Arab countries are uh, reactivated re or re-regularized, uh, then I think, given these, all of these assumptions, if they occur, uh, and of course uh, there's another assumption, assuming that you know, we restore some sort of fiscal discipline and we reverse the deterioration and the debt dynamics, I think we will have at that point enough basis to reinstigate confidence and to bolster growth. Uh, but this is on the short term. On the long term, obviously, the Lebanese government is suffering from structural deficiencies. And we need to uh, embark on a huge structural reform drive that was initiated somewhere uh, back in, the, in, in 2000 and 2007 at the time of the Paris conferences. Uh, and we got the endorsement of the international community and we saw the positive ramifications of these uh, confidence boosting measures and uh, actually we, we did uh, enjoy high growth rates uh, averaging around 8% between the period 2007 and 2010. So Lebanon, assuming there is confidence, assuming there is, you know, the, the security and political concerns are addressed, uh, assuming there is at least a, a, you know, a minimum semblance of political consensus, we have a high resiliency to, for our performance to be, you know, to be reactivated again. Uh, we've gone through very difficult times in the, in the past, but we've been able to come out of these difficult times stronger than ever, but assuming all of these conditions are met. Now, my concern is, is not just to achieve growth rates like we did uh, between the period 2007 and 2010. My concern is how to sustain these growth rates, how to shift these growth rates into job-inducing growth. Uh, and this is the 
paramount challenge, uh, and this would require, you know, enhancing our competitiveness. This would require, just as Spain is, is um, you know, is trying to do, is to reduce all inefficiencies in the labor markets. It's so how to attract FDI, how to enhance the doing business environment. Uh, there is a whole lot of measures uh, that the government, any government, has to take in order to at least put Lebanon on a sustainable growth path. But all this requires, you know, the, the, all the assumptions that I listed even before we start thinking of, of these measures. What are the lessons that can be derived from both of these countries and what we've heard of today? Um, Obviously, I mean, I, I, in, in the course of uh, what I just said now, I think the, the most important uh, uh, lesson is for both our economies is to how to engage the private sector sufficiently in order to, to you know, to, to leverage uh, uh, their involvement and to make it serve the economy. This is, this is crucial for both our economies. Uh, Spain has already started to do that at least by untangling some of the uh, obstacles to business uh, and uh, in trying to deregulate the business environment. We are still far from doing that. We've thought about it, we've worked with the World Bank obviously, but we have not uh, ratified any, any of these laws. Uh, and this is paramount uh, for us. Uh, another lesson I think that uh, we can derive uh, from uh, from our own experiences, is uh, that uh, what can Spain take away? What can Spain take away from Lebanon? I mean, uh, there has well, been Spain nothing. Is, no silver is already lining here, has but. woken up and smelled the coffee, as they say, uh, and they know that uh, they're facing uh, severe severe structural problems. That they're uh, suffering from. Uh, high employment, that they're suffering from low growth rates, that they need to enhance their competitiveness, and they've already, the government has already articulated an economic reform agenda, and even though I don't think they're out of the uh, red uh, zone yet, but I think they're, uh, they're on the right track. Uh, and, and, uh, an impressive thing they did, I think, is that they've realized that they need to cut on their wage bill, which they've done uh, quite aggressively, they froze in all uh, wages, I think. We froze the, public, the minimum wage, if I'm not mistaken, or, or new, new employment in the public sector. And you've tried to reduce pension payments. Uh, for Lebanon, we're doing uh, the opposite. opposite. Complete opposite. And uh, just now, as you probably know, there is a bill in Parliament uh, that is being uh, discussed by the Parliamentary Committee and uh, it has been approved at least by the Parliamentary Committee and this is a huge scare for us, at least as economists, because this would put a huge financial burden on public finance and it would uh, undermine competitiveness and would uh, um, increase the proportion of the wage bill out of the GDP by, uh, I don't know, three, four percentage points to reach 12% minimum of GDP, which is outrageous, and this is probably the, uh, the, the ratio that Greece uh, reached just before it went bankrupt. So we're, we're very concerned, frankly, about, about that. Uh, and I think, as I said, Spain is going in the right direction. Well, and one just thing that I can give to Spain, okay, Thank God. is that, you know, they've already taken huge steps uh, to uh, restore uh, economic, their economic uh, health and stability. But this is, and they've already started to uh, enjoy some of the fruits of this economic reform agenda, but this, there's still a long way in go, uh, to go. Uh, I want them to be inspired from the Lebanese experience, basically, that the stop and go approach that we've adopted for ourselves has really hurt us tremendously, and we're operating way below our potential. So if I can give anything to Spain is that, you know, they're starting to see this, these positive revival signs, but they need to maintain the positive momentum and, and inertia, and they should not, just at the first signs of revival, you know, hold some of these reforms and say, you know, we're now in the, in the good path and that we should stop. This inertia, this momentum has to be maintained for the long run. Thank you. Dr. Fahad, Ms. Rayan Hassan. Yes, yes, please. Uh, I, I second what Her Excellency had just said. 
uh, actually for the past three years we've been uh, as, as a private sector we've feeling that the government has been you know, in a completely different universe. We uh, raise the voice, we uh, talk about you know, indicators, uh, negatives, and uh, nobody, nobody listens. When, uh, when the uh, minimum wage was raised, it was uh, raised to a dub double the level that you know, was uh, uh, actually uh, confirmed by the uh, Central Administration of Statistics that the cumulative uh, uh, increase was at 17 percent, they raised the minimum wage by 35 percent. That really hurt the, uh, the private sector, you know, it, it had a very bad impact on operating expenses. Uh, you know, a lot of companies uh, either went under or, uh, or you know, were, were really uh, running in, in, in red. Uh, the, again, the, you now the pay scale of the uh, public employees is, is putting another strain on, on the economy. So we feel that you know, we're, uh, we're kind of moving in two different directions. We're trying to uh, you know, find our path for uh, profitability, for uh, well, not even profitability, we're talking about uh, continuity and, and survival, and uh, we, we don't seem to have anybody listening to us. So we've had a lot of uh, conferences, you know, trying to uh, let our uh, situation be known. And uh, of course, now when you look uh, on the ground, you see that the tourism sector and the trade sector are suffering extensively. And still, uh, I mean, we don't see any, any light. So uh, when, when we talk about, you know, a pessimistic outlook, it's, it's really quite pessimistic and we don't really see any, any light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to go back to you, Mr. Quinn, just because everybody's been giving a lot of negative yeah. feedback on Lebanon. I don't I think know. so much pessimism I did Yeah. I just, we were talking, they mentioned how important it was to focus on the private sector. And I know, what are the sectors of common interest? You were talking about the sectors of common interest between Spain and Lebanon. So yeah. if you want to elaborate on that and try to end on something positive that we can take away yeah, today. Uh, I mean, first of all, you know this. Spanish investments in Lebanon. Probably you'd be surprised to know that Spanish investments is our like one of the top investors in Lebanon, it, uh, out of the European investors. You would typically think that France and the UK and Italy are the top investment investor in terms of capital invested. Actually, Spain is the number one investor in Lebanon in terms of European investors. So this is based on Financial Times data from 2003-2010. And it seems that if you look at the number of projects, investment projects in Lebanon um, from European investors, then you have France and Italy that come first and second. But in terms of amount of capital invested in Lebanon, Spain comes first. So this is already positive news. We have to build on that definitely for Spanish investors. They need to add there is a precedent. There is already a good amount of investments being done. And there are around 900 jobs created by Spanish investors in Lebanon over the last seven years. So this is already a positive note. In terms of the, the sectors of interest, um, I mean, Spain is focusing on totally different sectors. They're focusing on like more the high-tech, the high-value-added sectors like biotech, aerospace, automotive, ICT, renewable energies. We're very far from that. We're still focusing on sectors that are very traditional, which have been in the investment law in 2001. So basically, IDAL is bound to promote sectors which were introduced in 2001, which means like 13 years ago when there was completely different context. So what we're trying to do at IDAL, we're trying, okay, we have these sectors, let's try to focus on something like, you know, where we have more value add. So again, the sectors of interest are really the ICT, the uh, renewable energy and biotech. I mean, renewable energy, we have to start looking in that direction. This is something that is very remote for Lebanon, uh, renewable energy. I can't elaborate much because, to be honest, there are very few companies in Lebanon working on that. I think this is something we should work on, especially given our high electricity bill. And I think this is something we should like tap into the experience of Spanish investors and Spanish company, which actually now I know that Spanish companies are working with Masdar in Abu Dhabi on the renewable energy project. So they already have, you know, uh, they've already like gone to the Arab market. So I think if for the few Lebanese companies working in the renewable energy sector, they could start working with the Spanish on this sector. And in terms of biotech, as I, as I was mentioning, a lot of products are being produced under license in Lebanon. 
So again, we can uh, advertise more. So what we can organize the chamber, actually a trade mission, and take some Lebanese companies involved uh, like, uh, in, in the pharma sector to try to introduce them to Spanish investors. This is actually what we're doing now with Italy. You know, like you're telling me, like, why Spain? We're actually doing this with Italy, with France. So we can do something similar for Spain. And the chamber, we're working with the chamber, and now we have a company going to Milan uh, this week to try to promote their, um, in, the bio, in the cosmetic sector, try to sell to Italian counterparts. So we have to be active. I mean, things will not flow by their own. The government has to play their part. They have to be, um, uh, they have to be like, proactive about it. So in terms of what Ilal is doing, again, we're identifying niches where we think we are strong in, which is the pharma sector, the biotech sector, the ICT sector. Uh, why the ICT sector? Again, because it's a very growing sector. It's a very fast, one of the fastest growing sectors in Lebanon. So this is why we're focusing on it, and the base companies are doing very well outside. So in terms of like the positive view at Idal, we're not that negative, because it's true Lebanese companies are not relying anymore on the local market, but they're going outside. And they're doing it without us. The government can help, you know, like helping in trade missions and like sponsoring fairs and getting access to market. This is what we're doing now. We're actually making them enter new markets. We're focusing on that. We're building on our relation with the embassies, with uh, Lebanese companies outside. So we're helping them access markets. So if we, I want to focus where the government can play a role, is actually helping companies go outside. So this is where, and I believe there is some positive news. It's not that negative. Because if, 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 if we had to focus on in this mindset, we would, we would do nothing at Idal, to be honest, because there's nothing to promote in terms of just coming to Lebanon and investing. But we have some niche sectors where we are good at, and we have to focus on these. And I think there is, um, you know, positive, there is a positive prospect. And for next year, we have like, some trade missions in, uh, in, in, the, in the pipeline, where we'll be promoting, again, Lebanon as an outsourcing destination for ICT and telecom sector, call centers specifically. Thank you. Dr. Garland, we're going to end with you and what you can take away from all this. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I have a few thoughts, I mean, based on the discussion, because I found it very, very interesting. The first one is, clearly the world is changing, and we all know that. That's so obvious. We hear about the, the emerging countries in Asia and all these, and, and we have to be aware of that. We all know it, but it's uh, maybe more significant than, than what we realize. So probably one, one, thing, uh, one thing I take from here, and, and it applies both to Lebanon, to Spain, to everywhere in the world, is really competitiveness. That's kind of the key word now, not competitiveness. How, do, how are we competitive? And there are issues that can be solved at that micro level, meaning the firms, there are issues that have to be solved at the macro level. So, so uh, again, those things in a way have been implicitly uh, mentioned now. We, the firms have to go out, and maybe there's got to be an environment, a macro environment, that allows for the firms to go out. And in, internally also, I couldn't agree more with the discussion about uh, uh, reform, how to lose your impetus on reform. That's easy. When things are going well, maybe you don't need reform. That's a problem. When things get more complicated, you're forced to do reforms, and, and it would be a mistake to stop those reforms now. But I think it, it, that's a positive side of the whole crisis, in my opinion, in, in Spain, but not only in Spain, in Europe. No? Uh, at the same time, I think that Europe, I mean, Spain and Europe are are almost, I mean, the, the situation of Spain is involved in the situation of Europe, and we could talk about fiscal policies that were referred to before, and monetary policies, and there's still lots of things that need to be done at the European level in order to move it ahead. Uh, but in general, I would end up with just maybe a couple of comments. The first one is, it does seem, I mean, from a macro point of view, it does seem like uh, 2014 is going to be overall better than 2013. What we're seeing is the U.S. starting a year ago, started to grow faster. What we're seeing is that despite a long way to go in the recovery in Europe, Europe is, is, is showing signs of recovery. Probably here we all still hear about Greece, and Greece is clearly a point of concern. But uh, we hear less about Ireland, and every time I say, well, the less we hear about Ireland, the better it is. So, so the same is happening with Spain. The less we will hear about Spain in that sense, the better it is for Spain. And Portugal also seems a few months from now to be getting out of the, of the whole agreement with the Troika and being able to uh, make their own uh, monetary and fiscal policy again, take control of the economy. So overall, I would say that the world situation in, in that sense is better, and that helps everywhere, despite the local problems in, in the country at level. Just one final remark. I thought it was very interesting when one thing I take from, from Spain, apart from the issue about the institutes, which I think is, is, is interesting, is I remember this discussion in business about what is called the small country advantage. But they say sometimes that small countries have an advantage in, in relation to large countries. For example, in what sense? What they say is, if you have a huge market, like, like the US, 
know, you don't have to worry so much about the rest of the world. You have such a huge market inside yourself with your own language anyway that you have, why do you have to go outside and really start looking for business in other countries? Well, when you're a small country, and I put here Lebanon on the one hand, probably Spain is intermediate, it's not such so small, but relative to the U.S. it's significantly small. It, I think that my feeling, again, not knowing much about Lebanon, is that uh, Lebanon, being a small country, has been, in a way, forced in the positive side to go out and to be very entrepreneurial, and to go to other countries in, in the region and to do business around the country. So, so I would take that. I mean, we, we, we think that spirit of entrepreneur, uh, being entrepreneurial and, and, and going abroad and having these languages, which is related to what you were saying and the education part, which I thought is remarkable, is something that probably uh, Spain is moving in that direction, but also would probably... Uh, uh, learn from the experience in Lebanon. No? So, so overall, that's that's what I probably would, would take from from discussion. And, and uh, but I think overall macro, uh, the world is doing better, and we're all facing different problems. I think Spain has to continue with its reforms, and hopefully also Lebanon will find a new government and try to solve these political problems. Thank you so much. We're going to be taking questions from the audience right now. Thank you. Just uh, a question for Professor Garland. Uh, going back to Spain, uh, do you think that the, uh, the political situation in general will help in this re process of recovery? This one. What about corruption at different levels, local, regional, and central? And what about the, the political instability? mainly in Catalonia, País Vasco, and I'm saying this for the f coming few years. This is my, do you think that the political situation will help in this going on recovery process? Thank you. Well, uh, I think about the political situation, I could talk for, and I'm not even the expert on political, but it's so broad, it's difficult to really address it in a few minutes, but I'll try to summarize in a way. Clearly now there's a, a government that has the majority in order to go ahead with some reforms and has helped over recent uh, years. And there's still two more years to the government and then there are new elections. Right now there's a lot of uncertainty about those new elections. And in fact, some people are, are more concerned not so much about the ruling party losing some of its votes, but really the two larger parties not being able to have enough power in Congress. Because Probably, if, if need arises, they will find some kind of, of agreement. I mean, there's one, one, at least one very important historical precedent to this, which was the Moncloa Act 10 years ago. And that was the time when the main party got together and said, we need these reforms, and these reforms, we have to agree on these reforms, they are important enough. So I think if uh, there's, right now, the, the, the crisis has brought out some of that. I mean, we'll see this a lot of I'm not saying necessarily that will happen, but yes, there is some. And so there was still the larger parties seem to support the general path of the economic policies in their policy. Now, there are crises also bring up, not in Spain, but everywhere in the world, situations of crisis might bring up some other situations which are a good time for them to appear, and therefore it brings up some nationalistic feelings in some regions, and that's true, it is happening. Again, there's uncertainty there, but I think that most of the country believes that those will be solved in, in, in due process by negotiating and, and so, so I think probably that seems to be more of a problem outside of Spain probably than inside. I'm not trying to say there is no problem. I'm saying probably hopefully this will be solved internally and there are discussions going on in that direction. There was a third, but I think it was more or less related to that one, right? Corruption. Right. That's right? Oh, corruption, that's right, yeah. No, corruption is, uh, again, it's funny that I keep on repeating myself in a way, but during, pro well, during times of growth, maybe corruption doesn't appear. Probably brings up more than a problem. Well, it's a problem. Not, not always, but, but it probably brings up a lot of it also. And I'm just thinking about the policy schemes or these kind of pyramid. I mean, those kind of tend to fall when things are not going well. But in any case, yes, there has been an increase and there's concern. That is clearly a concern. The last transparency in international ranking that came out 10 days ago of corruption has made Spain lose 10 positions, and you know that's corruption perception in it. So that means. A lot of people in Spain are feeling the corruption is significantly higher than what it was before. And that's clearly a challenge for the country too. And the country is expecting that the measures are being taken for these to be changed. Good evening. Um,
first of all, I would like to uh, talk about the Le Lebanon itself before talking about the relationship with, uh, with Spain or any other country. Um, I totally agree with Her Excellency Mrs. Al Hassan regarding the structural problems in Lebanon. We've seen governments not really tackling the root cause of our problems in Lebanon. It's not enough to be on the right path, in the right direction, on the right path. This uh, idleness is, is not enough. We have to convert it into action, action plans in Lebanon. We haven't seen anything. And uh, the most important problem is that we're not really investing properly in our resources. And then in Spanish they say, si del cielo te can limones, aprende a hacer limonada, no? So uh, we're not really making lemonade out of our resources. It means that if the sky gives you lemons, you have to learn how to make a lemonade at least. So uh, the thing is, we're remaining thirsty. We're not even drinking our own water, not even making the lemonade, maybe. So uh, now we've seen that we, we're about to exploit, for instance, new resources such as oil and gas. So let's see what the government will be doing with this uh, in order to really positively affect the economy. And two, regarding the foreign invest in, uh, investments, the FDIs. Uh, we can probably we can maybe divide the, the the thing in two. One, the the appetite of the foreign investors, and two, their confidence. The appetite. We have to talk about the legal structure and the fiscal structure. The, we I recently and Mrs. Naufels probably knows we have a common common uh, friend who works in Washington, and we were lately discussing. Uh, the, the recent uh, statistics of the World Bank, Lebanon did not really have a good standing in the statistics. And this morning, actually, I was also checking the report of the Transparency International, uh, Senor. So we saw also Lebanon is 127th rank, ranked so in terms of corruption. So the confidence, we have to tackle the political stability and corruption and others, and the legal and fiscal structures have to be amended at some point. And uh, besides that, good luck uh, <laughs> to the next government. And, Did you uh, want to ask a question to any of our Yes, panel? this is the question. How do you see? We saw that Europe, Athens, and Madrid, and all these capitals, we've seen them overcoming somehow their prices. Lebanon have a structural crisis, have a structural handicap. How do you advise, what do you suggest for the coming government to probably go outside of, of this crisis. I'm guessing your question is to Mrs. Hassan. To, to both, the internal and the external perspective. Sure. Uh, sure. I think I partially answered that, uh, that question uh, before. As I said, the key point, the key ingredient for any successful growth recipe is confidence. And this confidence ingredient is paramount to even start thinking about restoring economic stability. And that's missing right now. Spain is trying to address that. We have not even begun to do that. So confidence, and I said confidence comes from instituting several reforms. First of all, to have political consensus, to re remove any security concerns, to come up with a clear economic vision, to translate that into an agenda, to address the structural deficiencies, rehabilitation of the infrastructure. We know what should be done. There's no you know, magic recipe. We've talked about this millions of times under three conferences, uh, uh, under I don't know how many governments, uh, and we know, we know what should be done. What is missing? Is, is the political context. And this is something that is outside, obviously, our sphere of control. Uh, not saying completely outside, but there are a lot of developments regionally that have uh, domestic spillovers, and we are suffering from these uh, domestic spillovers. The first thing that should be done, obviously, is now we have two milestones. One is the election of a new president and the formation of a government. These are two prerequisites, and they have to be credible, they have to be neutral, and they have to come up with emergency plans at least to tackle the most imminent challenges. Otherwise, the list of what should be done is there. You just need the political wish. al went to Spain uh, with uh, Mr. Mohammed Sheir, uh, 
president of uh, Chamber of Commerce, and uh, they were trying to deal uh, or solve the problem of not having direct uh, flights from Lebanon to Spain. And uh, I'm sure all of you can give me like uh, your opinion uh, about uh, like uh, how would that imp how is that impacting, okay, uh, or uh, uh, making it difficult to do business with Spain. Because we, we, we as students, when we were studying in Spain, we suffered a lot. We had to go to Germany to come here or to France. So yeah, I just want to know what's the economic... Uh, but I think I read somewhere on the, yeah, on that there is now a transportation agreement between... Uh, yeah, and this year for the first time we had a direct flight, Beirut to Barcelona. But it was not for the, for the whole year, it was after... Uh, June and uh, we finished by the end of uh, October if uh, Ricardo and Catalina were with me. And next year we are going, well they are negotiated but we hope to have the same one month before and one later and three times per week, not only two. But uh, well, let's say that from the economic point of view of course uh, I, I give you <laughs> the possibility to, to answer. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, a good uh, effort to to try to exert on both the Spanish and Lebanese side. Uh, I, for what for whatever reason, I thought I read that there has been some progress done on that front in terms of the trying to uh, not Barcelona. Wasn't there any transportation agreement uh, sort of negotiated between the two countries? Precisely within the context of the Barcelona Lebanese. I mean uh, Beirut Barcelona was possible because we negotiated the agreement. Let's say before you negotiate, after you have the, the flight. Okay. And the agreement was last year, the flight was this, and we hope to continue, of course. And uh, if some uh, Lebanese companies. I mean, this should <laughs> be regularized so that it becomes a fact yeah. and not just cyclical in nature. If I may, you know, though, because I've given so much negative and I'm starting negative uh, prospects, <laughs> starting to feel guilty, I just want to maybe give a positive take, you know, and to brag a bit vis-a-vis -vis Spain with regards at least to our financial sector. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's maybe one of the few things that, you know, we, I think, have a one step ahead. <laughs> And we were very proud of our financial sector. Obviously, uh, our, our banking system is, is one of the soundest pillars uh, in our economy. And, uh, uh, you know, along with the supervisory and the regulatory framework, I think our banking sector is doing quite well. Uh, and, you know, some, some critics may say that, you know, even the central bank is playing a bit of a role that extends out of, uh, outside its mandate a bit, but I think at least having, uh, you know, uh, monet monetary authorities that are uh, trying to uh, play an active role in the economy by trying to promote growth through some of the financial packages that it's providing and through its supervisory and regulatory framework, I think we can stand um, comforted by the fact that at least with the high foreign exchange reserves that we have and with the uh, monetary uh, policies that are being implemented, financial stability for the time being is assured. And there is no uh, imminent pressures on the uh, Lebanese era. So at least we can come out of this uh, panel uh, you know, with some uh, uh, you know, satisfaction. <laughs> I believe that not all is, uh, is bad. Actually, there are some uh, positive uh, uh, you know, elements. Uh, and even the 1.5% growth rate that we are seeing currently is, is better than nothing, right? I mean, it, we could be in a recession, uh, but at least there is some uh, sh you know, very small growth rate, but at least there is growth rate that is being driven by whether it be you know, the Syrian uh, consumption or whether by the export increase or by port uh, activity or what have you. At least we are seeing some growth rates, albeit very modest, but at least growth rates are still there. Please, I would like to ask uh, Ambassador Hernando to come on stage and uh, the IE organizing team, please.
Well, and now we are invited. We are inviting all of you for a little cocktail that we have here with a little bit of Spanish tortilla, just to remember you from your time in Spain. Okay.